for tonight's program. Uh, author Terence O'Leary shares the heartbreaking stories of the Irish during the five long years of the potato famine of the 19th century. So please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Terence O'Leary. Thanks, Joe. Very good. Oh my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. First of all, I'd like to thank the Rochester Hills Library for inviting me here tonight. And the second thing I'd like to, stuck is, like to thank the luck of the Irish because I scheduled this presentation months ago and little did I know that, are we still on? Okay, little did I know that the storm was yesterday and not today. Can you imagine if I was coming up from Toledo yesterday? I, I don't know how many people, regrettably I did have a presentation down in Ohio yesterday and they ended up closing the library early and I felt bad about that, but driving up today, the roads were clear, traffic is what you're always going to see in Detroit, but I made it, and I'm just really, really happy to be here. So, my name's Terrence O'Leary, and I, with a name like O'Leary, you know I'm Irish. In fact, you know, my kids talked me into doing, how's this? Is that better? Oh, here we go. Okay. As I mentioned, with a name like O'Leary, people know I'm Irish. I can't run away from it. My grandchildren talked me into doing the Ancestry.com family. Turns out I'm actually 95% Irish. I have Irish on my mom's side, and I have Irish on my dad's side. I'm probably one of the last generations of the pure Irish here in America, because now the Irish are marrying so many. You know, it, when we were young, the Irish were very clannish, and you stayed together and you married together. And now that's not the case anymore. So, as I mentioned, I'm an Irish-American author. I have written six books. I'm working, working on the seventh one. I started out with young adult novels, and I wrote a trilogy of sports novels, football, baseball, and soccer. And they're all about teenagers facing a family crisis. And I finished what I set out to do. I finished the trilogy, and I was very, very happy with them and I was going through withdrawal. It's like, what am I going to do next? What am I going to write about? And I just drew a blank. I couldn't come up with anything. So we were sitting around, it was Christmas time, we were sitting around the kitchen table. And as the Irish are wont to do around Christmas, we started talking about our ancestors. And I remembered my Gigi, Irma Cannon, who lived to be 98 years old, and told me the stories of my ancestors. She had given me this book. This was like 30 years ago. But I was much younger then, and I wasn't that interested in my Irish ancestry, so this kind of like sat on a shelf. And I pulled this book out. This book has, is the history of all the Finneys on my mom's side of the family, going all the way back to the first Finneys who came from Ireland during the middle of the potato famine. Catherine and Patrick, Finney, they were evicted from their farm in Ireland. They had seven children. The oldest, the girl, Bridget, was engaged to be married. So she wasn't going to leave. No, even if they evicted her, she was staying in Ireland. And her youngest brother refused to let her stay there by, by herself. So he stayed with her. So they stayed behind in Ireland. Patrick and Catherine got on one of the famine ships that we're going to be talking about today. And they took that voyage across the ocean with their five children. Catherine and Patrick died on the famine ship. Never made it to America, like so many others at that time, during that time period. The five children were stranded in New York City. The youngest girl, Anne, was adopted by the Quakers. Two of the boys worked their way down to Boston and settled in Boston, and we lost track of them. We don't know what happened to them. Two of the other brothers, they spent the next years working their way across the country. They worked on the canals, they worked on the railroads, they worked on building the bridges. They made it as far as Dubuque, Iowa. They kept moving west because they heard about this, it's almost like a mystical town called Gary Owen which is just southwest of Dubuque. And the Irish had settled out there because the land there reminded them so much of the Ireland they left behind. 
So these two brothers finally made it to Gary Owen, and they fell in love with the land, and they bought a small farm. And they became farmers like they were back in Ireland. And they also helped to build St. Patrick's Church, which is a national monument that still stands today in Gary Owen, Iowa. One of those two brothers, Thomas Finney, was my grandfather's grandfather. And when I read that story, I said, my goodness, as an author, if there's a book that needs to be written, it's got to be that story. And that's what I did. I've, been spent, I've spent the last six years of my life studying the potato famine and writing stories about them. And I'm finally now at the point where I actually feel that I can explain the famine to other people. Because it's such a complicated issue. And it is such a tragedy for the Irish. And the famine changed the destiny of Ireland and also the United States. So we're going to spend some time together. We're going to be here for about the next hour. And I'm a storyteller, so I'm just going to keep talking. And if you can't hear me, just raise your hand. And if I see you nodding off, I'll just walk up next to you and pat you, pat you on the shoulder. OK. Now, we have to go back. We have to go back to Ireland in 1845. Do you realize that this is the 175th anniversary of the potato famine? 175 years since the famine began. But to begin our story, we have to go back a little bit further than that. Because we have to understand what Ireland was like in 1845. So we're going to begin our story in the 12th century. And that's when Henry II came from England and conquered Ireland. And Ireland, for the next 700 years, going up to the potato famine, was ruled by the English. And of course, the Irish history of Ireland is just one constant history of rebellion. The Irish refused to be governed. They wanted their own country. They wanted their own land. They wanted their own government. And they'd rebel and rebel and rebel. So we're going to go fast forward now. We're going to go to the 1640s. <clears throat> Oliver Cromwell. The Irish revolted again. Oliver Cromwell came to Ireland. When I you go to Ireland today, and you still, still today, you mention his name, people spit on the ground. That man more did, did more to destroy Ireland than anyone else. When he came to Ireland, Ireland lost one third of the population. They either were killed in battles, they died of disease, or the other thing that he did is he sent them out as indentured servants. Let's call it what it really was, indentured slaves. And they, he sent them to work on the plantations in America, in Virginia, in Georgia. He also sent them to work on the sugar plantations in the Caribbean. And the other thing that he did is he took the land away from the Irish. So all these Irish farmers who had farmed this land for centuries now became tenant farmers. They no longer owned the land. They had to pay rent in order to stay on their own farms. And what Cromwell also did is he gave the land to his cronies, his buddies who came over with him to conquer, conquer Ireland. So now, before he came, Ireland still owned 80% of the land when he left. The Irish only owned 8% of the land. And I wouldn't really say the Irish, that 8% was owned by Ireland. Because in order to be a landowner at that time, you had to swear allegiance to the crown. And that meant for the Irish Catholics that they had to give up their faith. And they refused to do that. So now, from 1640, we're going to go back. We're going to go a little bit forward now. We're going to go to 1690. And this is when the Irish rebelled again. And this time they took the side of King James, the Catholic King James, against George William, George William, William the Orange. And again, the Irish lost. So their punishment this time, they already took away the land. So their punishment this time were the penal laws. And what they did is they took away the right to the Irish to earn education. And they took away the right of the Irish to practice their religion. 
Now we're going a little bit further now, we're up to 1798, the Eilish rebelled again. And again, they were defeated. This time the French were supposed to help the Irish and the French did give, the help, did give some help to the Irish. But they both lost, the Irish and the French. The French we were captured, were exchanged as prisoners because it was the time of the Napoleonic Wars. The Irish who were captured were hung or burned. And that, that is what happened to the Irish. So that's pretty much what Ireland was looking at, what sort of country it was when it come up to 1845. Now, Ireland in 1845 was the most populous country in Europe. But it wasn't always that way. You go back to 1750, the population in Ireland was two and a half million people. When you come up to 1845, at the beginning of the famine, the population was eight and a half million people. How did a small country like that gain six million people in less than 100 years? And believe me, people from Europe were not running to go over to Ireland. So what had happened in Ireland is the Irish, the Irish married when they were very young. And that's one of the things I bring out in my books, Caitlin and Patty. The Irish would marry when they were 15 or 16. So you're getting a pretty good head start when you're marrying at 15 or 16. And the other thing about the Irish, I'm trying to think how a good way to put this. It's, it's like my daughter, Brittany, always to, tells me, she can just walk by her husband and she gets pregnant. <laughs> For some reason, the Irish are very fertile. And back then, it was very common for the Irish families to have 12, 15 kids. So it doesn't take long to increase the population when you're putting out a dozen kids for every couple. So Ireland was the most populous country. But this also brought with it a serious problem. Because remember we were talking about the tenant farms. As the population from one generation to the next increased, the farms became smaller and smaller and smaller. So at 1845, at the beginning of the famine, the average farm in Ireland, 25% were less than five acres. Another 25% were less than 10 acres. Now, I'm a city boy, I don't, I'm not a farmer. But from what I read, a family cannot live on a farm that small, especially when they're over there and they were mainly growing grain. And that's what the Irish had to do. They had to grow your grain crops, your grain is your wheat, your corn, oaks, barley. They had to grow the grain crops in order to pay the rent. But luckily for the Irish, or unluckily, whatever way you want to look at it, this miracle crop came into Ireland, and that was the potatoes. The English explorers brought the potatoes back in 1590. They came over to Ireland, and the thing, if you go to Ireland and you travel, especially the western part of Ireland, it's, it's rocky. It's, it's not a very good place to grow anything. But for some reason, the potatoes thrived in Ireland. And the farmers could plant one acre of potatoes would yield 12 tons of potatoes over the course of the year. And that was enough to feed a family of six for the entire year. And what they would do, St. Patrick's Day, just around St. Patrick's Day, they'd plant the potatoes. And the potatoes would come in in the fall. And they would take these potato crops as they came in, they dig these pits in the ground and they store the potatoes down there. And they'd also store them in the loft of their cabins. The potatoes would last all year long until the next season. And what the Irish did, now this, this is where it gets a little, little hard to believe, but the Irish lived on potatoes. The average man in Ireland ate between 12 and 14 pounds of potatoes a day. That comes out to be 60 to 70 potatoes a day. Now, when I was doing the research, my wife says, you, you have to do that, you know, to see what it was really like. I couldn't do it. 
you know, it's not a matter. You don't come home and say, honey, what's for dinner? Because <laughs> you know what's for dinner. And that is what the Irish would eat. But the funny thing is, most of the Irish back then, they lived on potatoes, but they usually had access to a cow so they could get some buttermilk. And they would usually grow one or two pigs a year. And they'd have some bacon. And you know how today they do all, go back and do all these scientific surveys and everything else. They found out that the Irish who lived on this potato diet with a little bit of buttermilk and, and a little bacon, they were taller, stronger than the English, their English counterparts who lived on a grain diet. So they were not only taller and stronger, of course we also know they were better looking. <laughs> so I guess you can live on a potato diet. But, and you, there's going to be a lot of buts in this story, so you're going to get used to that word. But what happens is if you rely on one crop, you're in serious trouble. And that's what the Irish were doing. In the 100 years before the massive potato famine, the Great Hunger, there were numerous blights, potato blights in Ireland. But they never lasted as long as the Great Hunger. And they weren't usually in, had, did not usually involve the entire country. In fact, what the English did when they had a serious potato blight back in 1792 to 1793, the English closed all the ports. So anything grown in Ireland stayed in Ireland. So the people didn't starve. Okay, now we've got the stage set. We're in 1845. The blight comes in, the beginning of the great hunger. The potato blight, infinitesimal perfora, which is a tongue twister for me, think of it as like a fungus. And what it does, it's airborne and waterborne. And the air and the water just carry it and spreads from one potato to the other. The potato famine, the blight, actually originated in America. It came into the ships. They were carrying grain to Ireland. And it spread not only in Ireland, but all the other countries of Europe had the potato blight. England, Scotland, Wales, Germany, France, they all came down with the potato blight. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So the blight comes in in 1845. It only affected about one quarter of the crop. So the Irish tightened their belt, and no one died. You know, with some hardships, but everyone lived through the potato blight of 1845. So the Irish, you know, like myself, what I would do is, you know, you cross your fingers, you say a prayer, you plant next year's crop. And they waited and waited for the crop, potato crop to come in in 1846. They said, the blight came in. It was like a dark fog that covered the land. And the farmers woke up to the most horrendous stink. And they ran out to their fields, and they looked at the potatoes. They lifted the potatoes up. If they closed their hands, the potato would squish and ooze out between their fingers. The potatoes all turned black. And that's why the Irish referred to the famine, the blight, blighted potatoes as black potatoes. Now, it not only affected part of Ireland this time, the, the blight spread across the entire country of Ireland. Now we have to be out, I have to take you back with me. We've got to put this in perspective because we don't, as Americans here, we don't understand the calamity, calamity that they were facing. Because today, here in America, if you don't have any potatoes, you open up the cupboard and you get something else. This mother who has these 12 children to feed, she goes to that cupboard and all she has are rotten potatoes. There is nothing to feed her family. And the tragedy, there's two other tragedies involved with this. As the Irish at the time were living beneath the poverty level, they had no money. During the five years of the famine, there was plenty of food in Ireland. If they could have gone to the city and gone into a store, they could have bought food. But they didn't have the money to buy it. So now the potatoes are blighted, and the Irish start 
to starve. And this was the beginning of the five long years of the potato famine. The Irish had no control over their government. They had no control over their destiny. They were starving. This is well before telegraphs and telephones and internet. But slowly the word got out, mainly from a lot of the Catholic priests would write to other Catholic priests in the United States and America and say, you have to do something. You have to help the starving Irish. And what happened now, all the world is looking at Ireland and in turn looking at England because England rules Ireland. The Irish are English subjects. It is up to England to do something. And England did do something. Their answer was public works program family relief. What it boils down into a nutshell, they put the Irish to work. If you go to Ireland today, you'll see what they call these famine roads. They had their Irish building roads that went nowhere. And what the breadwinner, what the father would have to do is get up before the sun rose, have to travel a couple miles to the work site. He would have to work all day long. At the end of the day, he doesn't get paid. He has to go home and come back and do it the next day and the next day and the next day. And at the end of the week, if they were lucky, they would get paid. But they wouldn't get paid enough in order to feed their family. So the family was still starving. But the tragedy was, if you're hungry and if you're sick, you can't work. And the Irish would drop dead along the side of the road. They'd never make it home. Over 700,000 Irish were involved with this public works program. And even the British government realized that it wasn't working. And they stopped it. They said, this isn't working. But luckily for the Irish, some help was coming in. It was coming from America and coming from Europe. There were donations coming in. But the major donation that really saved the Irish at this time, and to me it came from the most unexpected source, and that was from the Quakers. The Quakers came to Ireland and they brought 300 giant soup cauldrons and they made soup. And they shamed the English into opening soup kitchens to feed the Irish. And in the summer of 1847, when the Irish were starving, the English were feeding three million Irish a day. So that's it, right? The story is over. You know? But, but you know, there's going to be the but here. But things, the government changed. And now, remember we talked about Cromwell? Well, his buddy would be Charles Trevelyan, and he, Trevelyan was in charge of the purse string. He was in charge of the treasury. And he came out with this proclamation that said, from now on, Irish property would pay for Irish poverty. Now, what does that mean? It means that the English are no longer going to give money for famine relief to the Irish. The way they're going to get famine relief is they're going to tax the Irish. They're going to tax the landlords. They're going to tax the merchants. They're going to tax the farmers. And that money from the taxes is going to go to the workhouse. Picture this. Think about those of you who have read Dickens. I mean the workhouse. It's nothing more than a jail. The name tells what it is. You go there to work. It's not a free ride. My wife and I, when we went to Ireland to do all this research, we sat in a workhouse. And it is just like being in jail. But there's a couple big buts here. Because at that time, Trevelyan said, in the fall, when the new potato crop comes in, they're going to close all the soup kitchens. And to get soup, the Irish have to go to the workhouse. But there's a major problem here. There were 130 workhouses scattered across Ireland. These workhouses were designed to hold 115,000 people. So the English were feeding 3 million people, Irish in the soup kitchen. They're going to close the soup kitchens. 
and they're only going to be able to let 115,000 of the Irish go into the workhouse. Irony of all ironies, the potato crop comes in in 18, the fall of 1847, and there's no blight. The potatoes are healthy. It was the only, out of the five years, this was the only year during the five years when the potatoes were healthy. But what had happened? As you go back to the previous winter, 1846, when the Irish were starving, and this mother has no food to put on her table, she looked at the seed potatoes and she gave them to her children. Now, so I had a hard time with this because I didn't understand what seed potatoes were. I mean, my wife's a master gardener and she goes out and plants seeds and flowers come up. So I figured, you know, potatoes, you throw seeds on the ground and potatoes come up. But it isn't like that. Seed potatoes, you have your potato, you know those little white eyes on the potato? Those are the seeds. And what you do is you take that potato, you put it in the ground, and those white outs will sprout potatoes. But the Irish, what they did when they were starving, they knew they had to save seed potatoes to plant the new crop, but they ate them. They had no choice. So when the potato, potato crop came in in 1847, it was blight free. It's only one quarter of the amount of potatoes the Irish needed to survive. And once again, the Irish started to starve. And the English refused to reopen the soup kitchens. So now the Irish are starving. Now, there's like all these different strings of the story that we have to pull together. And you know, it, it's hard sometimes because, you know, we only have so much time, but it's important to understand what was really going on also in Ireland at the time, because there's all these stories about Irish genocide, about how the English are responsible. They were actually trying to kill the Irish. And where a lot of this comes from is the landlords. You know, they, they ran everything. They owned the estates, and the tenant farmers paid the rent to them. But times were changing, because this is the 1840s. And England had always looked at Ireland as being their breadbasket. That's where they would get their grain. But now there's this upstart country across the ocean in America that they can get grain from cheaper than they can get it from Ireland. And English, England's also involved in the Industrial Revolution. England at this time frame was the richest, most powerful country in the world. And they were industrializing. The farmers were coming off the farms in England and going into the factories. And they were making money. And with the money, what the, farm, what the workers wanted. They wanted meat on the table. So England now has grain coming in. What they want is beef and dairy products. And they look across the Irish Sea, and they see Ireland just sitting there. And they could grow their cows in Ireland, drive them to the markets in Dublin, put them on the ferry boats, and they'd be on the English table that night. And once the landlords got wind of this, they realized that if they could get rid of their tenants, which was the tenants weren't making a lot of money because it was, wasn't a good way to farm. These small farms, you know, you'd, it, they're not money producers. So they wanted to do away with all these small farms and tear down the Irish stone wall, walls and turn it into pasture. And that's what they did. So they started evicting the Irish off their estate. And on top of this, and this comes in with the genocide theory, is the English, when they increased the taxes on the landlords, that was a tax was placed on every Irishman who worked on their estate. So if they could get rid of their tenants, they'd get rid of those taxes. And they saw the light at the end of the tunnel for them is they could make so much money that the Irish would just leave. The Irish would be gone. And they evicted over 700,000 Irish. Many times, all it took the sheriff would come and post on your door the notice to quit. And that means he'd be back the next day. And if you did not have the money to pay the rent, 
And of course, none of the Irish had the money to pay the rent because they were starving. If they didn't have the money to pay the rent, the sheriff would arrest the bread owner and put him in prison. And the family realized, you can't, we're not going to survive anyways. We're not going to let the husband go. And a lot of them would just voluntarily get up and go off their estates. And those who fought, you know, there's so many first person, person accounts I've read doing all this research. And it's just so heartbreaking. You have this, especially, you know, the grandmothers being pulled out of her cottage and sitting there on the side of the road as she watches the soldiers tumble her cottage and burn the thatched roof. And where does she has to go? There's nowhere to go. So once they're evicted, their choice is to get go to the workhouse. But we know this workhouse is only designed for 115,000 people. And there are 3 million Irish that are starving now. But we have, to, we have to talk about the death of the Irish, because this is where it gets to be kind of confusing also. Because I, I admit myself, I'm always saying starving Irish. And the Irish were starving. But if you look at the cause of death, the Irish died of disease. Nine out of 10 of the Irish died of disease. They did not starve to death. And the reason for that, if you study history, anytime you have a famine, you have disease. The two go hand in hand. When you have a famine, people become weak. Become weak. They become susceptible to illness. Their hygiene just falls apart. They can't take care of themselves, much less take care of anyone else. And they would succumb, succumb to all the diseases. And there was cholera. And, but, you know, the big disease, the disease that gave the Irish nightmares was black fever. This typhus, and the Irish would call it black fever, and they call it black fever because what typhus would do is it invades the blood vessels in your body, and the vessels get blocked until they swell up, and when they swell up, they finally burst, and your skin turns black. It's the most horrendous way to die. You get gangrenous sores, you get terrible headaches, you have an un... un bearable body stench coming out and you're vomiting and you they would go on there's no cure for it they would go on for about two weeks until finally just their heart would just give out and the scariest part of black fever of typhus it was carried by lice so in this room here all it would take is just one person and we're sitting close together, and the lice would jump from one body to the next. The Irish who could make it into the workhouse, 25% of them died of disease within three months. So now the Irish are dying. This, this is where we're, we're now in Black 47. This was the worst of the worst time for the Irish. And you've got three choices now. You can give up, and regrettably, a lot of the Irish did. They just couldn't. They didn't have the fortitude. They just couldn't bear it anymore. There are stories you'd walk into a cottage and the whole family would be in one bed and they'd all be dead. They succumbed to diseases. So a lot of the Irish did give up. The other choice was trying to get into the workhouse. Workhouses, again, were only designed, to, there was only 130 of them. Skibbereen was like the epicenter. Skibbereen's down by Cork. It's in the western part of Ireland. And it's the epicenter of the famine. famine. Anything that happened bad with the famine happened at Skibbereen. And at that workhouse, when the famine, when the soup kitchens closed, the Irish, there were, there were, this, this, the Skibbereen workhouse was only designed to handle 800 people. At the height of the famine, there were 3,784 people outside the workhouse waiting to get in. There's a graveyard where if you go to Ireland, you need to visit. It's called Ebistruli, and it's near Skibbereen. All it is is a gigantic pit in the ground. There are eight to 10,000 Irish that died during the famine. They were just tossed into this pit. So that's your choice. You give up, you try to get in the workhouse, or your third choice. And your third choice is to get out of there. 
and the Irish would do whatever they could to get out of Ireland. And what we're going to do, we're going to take a little voyage now. We're going to take, we're going to be like the Irish. We're going to go on a ship. We're going to see what one of these famine ships were like. But before we do, let me just grab a sip of water. Now, before we begin, why don't you just take a look around, just kind of smile at your neighbor. You might want to say hi. Probably some of you already know each other. But, you know, it's kind of important to do this because this is a good crowd. This is a good sample of what of the Irish would be on a famine ship. Now, I hope that you like your next door neighbor because we are going to be together for a minimum of the next six, for the next six weeks. And you know what? We're not going anywhere. So you look at that neighbor, we're gonna, you're gonna see him for the next six weeks. So what sort of ship are we gonna be going on? I'm sure some of you have probably taken a cruise. Not gonna be like that. <laughs> there were steamships coming out back in the 1840s. They were a novelty. The Irish could not afford to get on a steamship. So the Irish would be going on what we call a famine ship. These were sailing ships. And what they were, if these ships came from Canada, they were carrying lumber down in the, in the hold. If they came from America, they were carrying grain. And they take the grain and the lumber over to England. And then the ship captains would find out that you know, you need to stop in Ireland because those Irish are so desperate, they'll do anything to get out of Ireland. So he'd stop back in Ireland, and he's got this ship that's designed to carry lumber and grain. And he'd send his carpenter down into the hold of the ship. And along that wall over there, you see where these tables are? That'd be similar. It'd be a, they'd make a platform. This would be a bed platform. Imagine it coming out to about here all across the one side of the ship. There's no separate beds or anything. This is just a platform. And there'd be another platform up here. And that's where you're going to sleep. And you know what? We're going to all sleep together. You don't have your own cabins. You don't have your own beds. We're going to be together on these. And if you know families would try to stay together, they might bring sheets and put a sheet up for a little privacy. But let's, let's think about what else we're going to be facing down on the hold of the ship. It's designed to carry grain. There's no windows, there's no ventilation. There's no lights. The only light that you're gonna have down there is a whale oil lamp. That's the light that we're gonna have. And down here, right about where the middle is gonna be, the carpenter would have made a big table. And during the day, the men would gather around the table in good weather, and they'd play cards or tell their stories. Then I also mentioned there's no running water, there's no electricity, but the absolute, one of the biggest problems, there's no toilets. I mean, what are you gonna do? There's buckets, that's it. And, and about, how about taking a shower? No showers. If you're lucky, if you're crossing in the summertime and if the captain was generous, he might let you come up on deck for maybe an hour a day. But the Irish in 1847, they were so desperate that they would try, they'd cross the Atlantic Ocean in the wintertime. You never take a sailing ship across the Atlantic Ocean. There's two, you know, besides, besides the storms, the wind, the wind, the westerlies come out of America and blow the sailing ships over to England and Ireland. Coming back, the westerlies are against you, and you have to tack against the wind. And if you had a storm, and you can be blown off course, that storm could last, you know, you, you, you get blown off course, you're going you're gonna to run out of food. Because that's the other thing I forgot to tell you. I hope you brought some extra food with you. Because the captain's only going to give you the bare minimum. And if you don't have extra and you hit a storm, you're going to starve. And water, you can't drink ocean water. And you put, they'd have water in barrels. And you imagine what that would taste like after six weeks. 
So here you are. We're, we're all together. We're having a grand old, did, did I mention about the rats? I mean, the ships carried grain. If you have grain, you have rats. So, you know, the rats, the rats are going to be there. Picture this. You're going across the Atlantic Ocean, and you hit one of those winter storms. And the captain shouts out, batten down the hatches. So you're down in the hold of that ship. The first thing they do is they blow out the oil lamps, they extinguish them. You cannot have an open flame on a wooden ship in a storm because if that lamp falls and breaks, that's the captain's biggest fear that his boat is going to burn down around him. So they, you're locked in, no picture. Picture all the lights being off here. This, you know, again, we know windows or anything there. Picture being down in that hold. And you're on the ship that is rocking, water's coming in up to your feet. You don't know how long it's going to last. The storm might last for hours. It might last for days. Think about being on the scariest roller coaster you were ever on in your life. And times that times 100. People are getting sick next to you. People are sobbing. People are praying. People went stark, raving mad. And that was life above, above, upon a famine ship. But as bad as all of that was, that isn't what gave the Irish nightmares. No, not on the famine ships. They could put up with all that. Their terror, their nightmare was, you didn't even notice, one of the gentlemen who came in late, he was scratching in his collar. Why would he be scratching in his collar? He's carrying lice. And he's among us. And we're out in the middle of the ocean. No place to go. No place to hide. And that disease would spread from one body to the next. There's no doctors, no hospitals, no medicine, no nurses. No one to take care of you. The sick would lie next to the dying, and the dying would lie next to the dead, and the sharks would follow the famine ships across the ocean as they tossed the poor bodies of the Irish into the deep. 30 to 40% of the Irish who went on a famine ship never made it to America. So many died that the Irish started calling the famine ships Coffin ships. Give me one second. But, 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 look around. Smile. We made it. I don't know how we did. I don't know how our ancestors made it. Maybe they came before the famine. Maybe they came after the famine. But they made it. So what sort of life awaited us? Here, Patty and Caitlin, they finally make it across the ocean. What are they going to come to America? What are they going to see? You have to remember, the Irish were tenant farmers. Like in Patty's case, the father had, didn't have, whatever money the father had, he gave to Patty to get him across on the ship. The other rest of the family stayed behind. So when Caitlin and Patty reached the shores, and they go to New York City, 75% of the Irish who came to the United States came through New York City. So they end up in New York. They have no money. They have no skills. They're dirt farmers. They're not bricklayers or bakers or doctors or lawyers. They're farmers. They have no skills, they have no money, and worst of all, they have no education. Six, to remember, go back to the penal laws, 60% of the Irish who got off the ship couldn't read or write. You know, if you're Irish you, and you look at your ancestors, like in my case, there's so many different spellings of the Irish names. And the reason for that is because the Irish couldn't write their name. So whoever, they, they'd say their name and whoever was writing names would, Put down whatever you wanted. 
because they couldn't write their own names. So they come to America, and they come in the wintertime. There are no jobs in the wintertime. And the Irish, like Caitlin and Patty, they ended up in the worst slum in the world, which was Five Points. I don't know if you ever saw the movie, Gangs in New York. That's, that was the life of the Irish, in the ghetto, in Five Points, in New York City. So now, you're in. You're down in a cellar, starving to death in New York City. You came to America for this. The Irish back home in Ireland, they're starving in their mud cabin. They lived like that. History has shown it made no difference. If you stayed behind in Ireland, 25% of you are going to die. If you get on a famine ship and come to America, 25% of you are going to die. So what difference does it make? The difference was, like Caitlin and Patty, is they came to America, and they came at the exact right time to come to this country. They didn't have an education, but they knew how to work, and they weren't afraid to get their hands dirty. So they would take, the first generation would take jobs no one else wanted. They would dig the subways. They would dig the foundation for the skyscrapers. They worked, you would work down the railroad. You know, it's, it's so hard, because I, I, could, I could talk all night about this, and I know I've got to more or less skip to the plan here. But if you, you know, like this new book I'm working on is about the Irish and the railroads. You'd see the, all these railroads and the towns that spring up by them all have the Irish sections. And the Irish, once they had enough money, they wanted their own house, their own farm. And they'd stop, they'd get off the rail, working for the railroad and they'd buy that. And the ones who really had the wherewithal and were industrious was like my grandfather's grandfather. They saved their money. It took them 10 years. But they finally saved enough money to buy their own firm. Do you have any idea what that means to an Irishman? For 700 years, they couldn't own their own land. Now out in Iowa, my great father's grandfather wakes up and he looks out that window at his fields, and that's his land. And he can leave that to his son and his grandchild. 700 years, and they lived in Ireland, they couldn't do that. That is the blessing American gave them. But the second blessing, the Irish are clannish. If, I mean, if you're Irish, you know that. And most of the Irish, when they got off that boat, they didn't go anywhere. They stayed right there in the cities. In fact, when they did the census in 1850, during that decade, 1840 to 1850, one out of two immigrants coming to the United States were Irish. In the 1850 census, 25% of the big cities, you're talking New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, they were all Irish. And what the Irish found out when they came to America is they've got this thing called a democracy. I mean, you can vote. You can have a say in your own government, which they haven't had for 700 years. And believe me, the Irish took to that. You know, as far as voting, and what happened is by voting and using that power, they led to the patronage jobs. So they now became New York policemen, New York firemen, Boston, Chicago. They became the councilmen. They became the building inspectors, and then they got involved with politics, and they became the mayors and the governments, governors. Twelve presidents in the United States have Irish ancestry, and they learned that they could now, the first generation might be digging ditches, but their children now are owning shops, and their life is so different than what it ever would have been back in Ireland. But the third blessing, the third blessing that the Irish received, and this is the one that is closest to my heart, and this is what makes me grieve more for the Irish than anything else. If you go back and you study the history of Ireland, you go back to the glory of Ireland, the time of St. Patrick, 
the time of King Brian Baru, who united all the clans in Ireland and drove the Vikings off? During that time frame, Ireland was the light of the world. England, I mean, England, Europe was involved in the Dark Ages. There were 800 monasteries in Ireland, and they were all towers of learning. The Irish preserved the Book of Kells and all the literature while the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages were going on in Europe. Now, when you come to America, you have the right to an education. And you cannot talk, you cannot talk about the Irish in America unless you talk about the Catholic Church because the two went hand in hand. And what the Catholic Church did, they did more to help educate the Irish than anyone else. I'm a living testament to that. I had Catholic grade school, went to Central Catholic down in, for high school. My mother always said, Terry, you have to have your tools. You know, I got so tired of hearing that. You know, what, what do you mean? What do you have to have your tools? You have to have an education. You have to have the skills. My father worked two jobs his entire life. I have five sisters, and he put us all through school. And that the Irish have such a love of learning. And that is why I grieve more than anything else of the 700 years that England ruled Ireland, what would Ireland would have been like if they could have had education? If the English wouldn't have hung the ones who rewrote it? What if they had control of their own destiny? But they didn't. And that's what I grieve for. My grandfather's grandfather, when he came over, he was a common laborer. Grandpa O'Leary, on my O'Leary side, who came over in 1880, he was a common laborer. You look at everything that the Irish have accomplished here in the United States in the last 175 years. Look at any field of endeavor, whether it's arts, sports, literature, politics. The Irish have succeeded far beyond their wildest dreams. And what the Irish also did, they, they created their own new towers of learning. Your Georgetown, your Boston colleges, the Golden Dome of Notre Dame. Learning is so important for the Irish. And that was the third blessing that America gave them, the right to an education. You know, when I started giving this talk, I was calling it the potato famine, a terrible blessing for the Irish. And I still believe that. It was a terrible, terrible blessing because the Irish who survived the famine of the horrors of the famine and the loved ones they lost, they succeeded here far, far beyond they ever would have been able to do in Ireland. And if you look at the history of Ireland, in 1845, at the beginning of the famine, there were eight and a half million Irish. In 1921, when Ireland achieved independence, there were less than four million people left in Ireland. Picture a country that has lost half their population. And that's what happened to Ireland. And you know where they went? So many of them came here. The last census that was taken in the United States, there are th over 34 million Irish Americans. The whole country of Ireland, North I Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, there is 6.8 million. There are seven, seven times more Irish Americans than there are Irish in Ireland. And the last statistic that I saw shows that there are 80 million Irish worldwide. And this, the whole history of Ireland goes back to the potato famine. That's what set everything in motion. And for the ones who came to our country, it was a blessing. Now, what I needed to do, as you can tell, I've become an advocate. I mean, I think the potato famine is so important to the Irish culture and history, and it needs to be remembered. But it isn't. It's a footnote in history now. You'd look at younger kids. I do a lot of library and school talks. 
They know nothing about the potato famine. They know nothing about what our ancestors went through. So I want them to know the story. I've read so many books. There are so many great books that were written about the facts and the figures and the numbers of the potato famine. And I read most of them. But I didn't want to do that because I'm a storyteller. I want to write stories because my thing is I want you to feel, I want you to be with that family, with that mother when she look, opens that cupboard and the potatoes are rotten. So I set off, I spent the last six years writing Caitlin and Patty's story, Danny's story, and the new book, Michael's story that I'm working on. Caitlin and Patty's story it mimics what my ancestors went through. They're young lovers. They marry when they're 16. You travel with through, through Ireland, you see what life was like through their eyes at a time when one million Irish died and one million Irish immigrated. You go with them on a famine ship. Believe me, you think the talk was bad. Wait till you see what happened to them really in the ship. And they end up in New York City, again in five points, like so many of the Irish. But the whole time I'm writing this story, I say there's a whole other story that needs to be told because the famine went on for five years. Danny was the middle brother. Danny stayed behind in Ireland. In Danny's story, you see how the Irish were forced to build roads to go nowhere. You see them being evicted from their small farms. You see them end up in the workhouse. But you also see the tenacity, the Irish, their will to survive. In the third book, Michael's story, that's, he's the youngest brother. That's also about Ireland, but also about the Irish coming to America after the famine. So I wrote those, you know, I started out really writing them just for my children and grandchildren because I want them to know the story. And it's, it's like I said, it's taken on a life of its own. I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to come here tonight and talk with you. I do a lot of the Irish fairs and a lot of the Irish festivals. And if you're interested in my books, I do have them available. We take cash, credit cards, you know, you name whatever you want. But my main thing with my books is that you read them and enjoy them, but pass them along. You know, this story needs to be remembered. It needs to be told. Now, the Irish. The Irish still have a love of potatoes. When I was over there, the Irish eat more potatoes per person than any other country in Europe. And I can't go to an Irish festival without seeing potatoes all over the place. And I know I, the big day's coming. I know it's not too far away. And I know a lot of you are going to get your jigs dinner. And you're going to have your corned beef and cabbage. But you know the potatoes are going to be on that plate. And when St. Patrick Day runs around, comes around, and you go out, you know, I, all I ask you is when you sit down for that jigs dinner and you see those potatoes, maybe you could just take a second and maybe say a little prayer for your ancestors. Maybe you can give them a little toast and think about all the struggles that your ancestors went through so that you ha can have a seat at this table. But thank you so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. You're a great audience. And luck of the Irish, we had the good weather tonight instead of yesterday. Thank you. <laughs>